3312. Hello, 3312, whoever that is. Welcome on board. Ruby's here, Simon's here. Okay, crowd is here. And we're going to go ahead. Our story, I'm finishing up today, stories of the 100 years of Hollywood Temple Bethel. I'm doing this as... Uh, much to entertain you as it is to create a historic narrative for us, for future generations. So at some point, some of you will say, aha, there was this synagogue where actually the people who were Jewish in the film industry actually got their start and helped start the film industry. That's a point that the Academy Museum forgot in its uh, opening months. They are going to correct it. They're going to have a special exhibit coming up. But uh, I'm going to see if I can get this stuff to them that I'm putting together in some way or uh, fashion. Let me <laughs> see. Next week, I have uh, Rabbi Jerry Cutler from the Creative Arts Temple tell us stories about his connection as talent manager with some of the funniest people in entertainment who happen to be Jewish, uh, or there's the funniest people uh, who are Jewish who happen to be in entertainment. Maybe it goes that way. Uh, so... <laughs> A Jews funny? I don't think so. Never. But um, <laughs> then after that, I'll have Roger Rosen come on, tell us stories about from his memories, what he heard from his grandfather. <coughs> Later on, I'll be away in March in Israel. When I come back, I have lined up a friend who's a film producer. He's done independent films with Canon Globus. He's Israeli, settled in the United States. Uh, Gave Kirsty Alley her first movie that made her uh, start her in her career. So his name is Sam Fürstenberg, and oh. he'll talk about Jews in Hollywood. From he's a very good, very knowledgeable speaker on that. So that's coming up. When we get back in the saddle, I hope we can try something like a film series. series like run a series of five best Jewish films ever, and then pick up one of the five best Israeli films ever. Uh, something like that. Let's see if we can get things back in place. That's my uh, goal and expectation. All right, so now, go back to my share screen for my story here for all of us. So, let me pull this up. And part two of, well, let me get back here one second. What am I doing here? Let me go back to this one. Spotlight. Okay, I'm spotlighted me, everyone. Okay, is that spotlighted? Everybody can see me? Okay. So here I am. My story about Hollywood Temple. This is part two. Uh, last week, we talked about the early figures who were here, who were instrumental in establishing Jewish community in this area with Hollywood Temple Bethel as their home. And as I noted, this was the oldest existing congregation in the Hollywood area, Hollywood Hills, West Hollywood, Hollywood. So of course we can't start without paying attention to our magnificent sanctuary, 1952, the inside, I showed you the outside, the inside, these beautiful stained glass windows, travertine marble on the front, and of course, you know, we, we, we haven't had a chance to use that, but we forgot our beautiful chapel also. We shall be going back to it eventually with, again, also stained glass windows. And here, the newer building, the one set up, I think it was 1972, and it was built. And you can see the extension here, our chapel, the dome building. So that was nice. They incorporated this classic image of what may have been a, an intent to capture the flavor of the ancient Temple of Solomon. And with the dome structure, which was very popular in synagogues uh, the last century. And then the newer building, the now Neiman Hall, but was then known as the Factor Building. And I'll tell you the story behind that. So the style of this sanctuary also is considered Art Deco. And it's been on the site of the Art Deco Tour Society for some time now. Uh, it was on the tour route. And... We have three sets of stained glass windows here of the 12 tribes, large windows up in the main sanctuary crafted by Francis J. Durham in 1967. I was trying to see who beat who, because uh, oh, they're very Chagall-esque, but Chagall did his windows in 62 at Hadassah Hospital, and this was 67. So I guess Chagall influenced him. They did a very good job. You take a look at them. Then in the sanctuary lobby, if it hasn't, mm -hmm. 
been messed up by the redesign. There was a, uh, I think it was, it was removed. There was a sanctuary, there was a stained glass window in the lobby done by Joe Young, who was the architect for the Holocaust Museum in Pan Pacific Park. I don't know if the landlords messed it up because there was a special lobby there with you, uh, and I think they removed it. So over the course of years, there were many unusual, interesting people involved in the congregation. I'm just gonna mention some people that we know. For example, uh, you know, we've had this wonderful nursery school. It was run by Harriet Levins and before that by Barbara Dratto. And I had a chance, Harriet was running the school and I was there, the chance to meet with the parents. I would go to the parents, I would go to the kids every Shabbat Friday afternoon for have a have a good Shabbat, good Shabbat, Terry had her songs for them. And one of the parents was a self-help guru, Marion Williamson. And she, if you remember, was one of the candidates on the, in the Democratic primaries. She was up there at the um, debates. She didn't go very far, but she was there. And she was from Houston, Texas and grew up in Beth Yashur and says, possibly I may actually have run into her when I was at Beth Yashur as well. Then one of my last acts at Hollywood Temple of Philip before we went into education was to convince a noted star of both Broadway, Israeli cinema, and the Yiddish theater. That is uh, Mike Burstein. And he played in Barnum. He played in Israeli cinema, Kuni Lemel, Yiddish theater, Miguel Abitzik Menger. I convinced him to serve as a high holiday cantor, even though I was no longer officiating. I already left the position at that point. But I convinced him to do it for us. And then... We get interesting people from the neighborhood to come in. John Ritter from Three's Company would come here, not to pray, but to play bingo. And Shelley Winters would come by for a garage sale. And there was a young actor by the name of Roy Dolliner who came here from New York. And he tried to help us get activities that would attract young people in the entertainment community. And then uh, he didn't enjoy LA. So he went back to New York. And as I found out, he went back to Rome and he's become known as an expert on secret stories hidden in the Sistine Chapel. So if you look up his name, Roy Dolliner, you'll find an interesting website about all of the secrets inside the Sistine Chapel. And uh, I know, for example, when I was there, the, the guy there showed me how Michelangelo loved to play dirty jokes on people that, uh, nasty jokes on people that he didn't like out there in the ceiling. So... <laughs> That's a good tie side topic. And then of course we have our last official Cohen. I mean, we've got Murray, but uh, Murray Maiden, but then our last official Cohen who would still, I could count, I could get him to try the Dukhan. And he was a great reader for our holiday services, if you remember, Aubrey Morris. And here's from his obituary in The Guardian. This was young Aubrey Morris. Stalwart character actor who appeared as Mr. Deltoid in a clockwork orange and as one of the gruesome locals in The Wicker Man. You remember mm -hmm. the Clockwork Orange picture, a vicious and rough movie. Uh, yeah. Doesn't match the Aubrey that we knew. So here's this description. The character actor Aubrey Morris was praised in 1957 by Kenneth Tiner for his mimic, mimetic cunning, wreath in cringing smiles. Adept of vaguely camp and suggestively sinister, Morris always left an unconventional stamp on even the smallest the seemingly unconventional roles, small with the gleaming eyes and sun. Okay, there's something. Came from a family of actors, and several would attend services with uh, here with him. Also, his brother Lionel, uh, his sister would come by. So it was so much nicer and sweeter than the character he played. Now, um, when you're a rabbi, you get to do some interesting funeral stories, also. And I never want to tell tales of class. But I did get an okay to talk about this one, so I'm going to tell you. And I got the okay from the son uh, who, a daughter who, or the son who wrote this story about uh, the background here. So he said, it's okay, you can talk about it as long as you've mentioned my book called Hiding in Plain Sight, True Crime, available on Amazon, Robert and Carol Teitelbaum, there's the link. So I was called on to do a funeral for Esther Melnick Teitelbaum. And her husband, her, her nephew, handled all the arrangements. And he really adored her because she had <clears throat> really came from, had, had a very poor upbringing and background. And she picked him up and she nurtured him and she advanced him. And he made, uh, made it good. It was re really very much cared for. Her. So he told me about her being a very successful attorney who in her day, this is the 30s, 
was the first woman to plead a case in front of the United States Supreme Court. Historic precedent. After the funeral, he asked me to go over to a crypt of her child who died in infancy, and he asked me to make an El Mole prayer for the child, which I did. And then he pointed out to me that right next to her was the crypt of Bugsy Siegel, Bugsy of Las Vegas fame and the mob. Very interesting story. Well, he, expect, he didn't want me to mention this before the funeral. Mention, he didn't want to tell me this before the funeral because he said, it would have been awkward. You know, in the eulogy, you want to tell the truth. So you don't want to have to lie. So if you don't know, it's better. But she was the attorney to Al Capone, Bugsy Siegel, Mayor Lansky, and quite a lot of others. All right. How did she get to Al Capone? The story was her brother was the attorney for Al Capone, couldn't spring him from the tax authorities who had got him. And the gangsters broke into the house to look for Al Capone, for, for her brother. And she and her husband got up and said, wait, don't, don't spare our brother. We can solve the case. And they solved the case and got him out. Okay, that's why the other people in the mob came to her. Okay, as I say, as a rabbi, you come across very interesting people with unusual backgrounds. But I'm going to go to some people with some really important backgrounds for us now. Here's one name that I'm sure very few know, Anatole Ponve. He was one of the presidents here, but we really need to tell his tale. Uh, and I found out about him somehow looking up, you know, you start fishing off for stuff with Hollywood Temple Bethel and Google, you never know what you find. And I see this footnote in a book called The Fugu Plan written by Rabbi Marvin Tokayer. He had served as a Navy chaplain, the United States Navy chaplain in Japan in the 70s. And a very successful writer. He does travel, um, all sorts of travel to, group travel to Jewish places of significance around the world, still active today. And maybe the Rosa had been on one of his tours. So Rosa Rosenberg, I think so. So anyway, the story of the Fugo plan, going around about in a circle to get to my point, was that the Japanese believed during World War II, they believed Nazi propaganda about the Jews controlling everything that they had heard. And so they went about sending spies to the United States to find the rabbis in charge of the elders of Zion, particles of the elders of Zion. They called this the Fugu plan. And if you know about the fish, there's a fish that the Japanese love, which is called the Fugu fish. It is a highly poisonous fish, a neurotoxin. If you test it the wrong, taste it the wrong way, you're dead. But if you know how to take out that gland that produces the toxin, it is one of the greatest delicacies on earth. So the Japanese were sure the Jews were like the fugu fish. If you mess with the Jews, you're dead. But if you know how to get to them the right way, they would be highly delicious. The Germans didn't know how to deal with the Jews. That's what the Japanese felt. So in his research, one of the names that came up in his research was this Anatoly Panve. So I find this as a note in his book, Anatoly Panve in the United States when war with Japan broke out. I'm not going to read this because I'm going to give more background about it, but he said, the later returned to California and became president of Hollywood Temple Beth El. I know it like Hollywood Temple Beth El. Well, he was in Japan. How did he get from here to Hollywood Temple Beth El? So I found this report, 1950 something from the Jewish Telegraphic Agency archives about Jews living in Japan. And so here's the Jewish community of Japan in Tokyo established in 1953 by merchant Jews from the Chinese cities of Harbin and Shanghai. What is this Harbin? We'll find out about it later. The criteria to be a member was to be able to speak Russian, play poker and drink vodka, one of the members said. And one of the distinguished guests in this article was one of our members, Edward G. Robinson, who called the center saying, I need a minion. If you remember last week, I mentioned that uh, he ended up with some uh, visiting somewhere else and he took the honor of leading the services, Edward G. Robinson, one of our members. Well, the founder of Tokyo's organized Jewish community was a Russian textile businessman, Anatoly Ponve. He had established a synagogue in Kobe, Japan, before that in 1937 was a major harbor city. Well, what was he doing there? During the early 1940s, Ponte was among those who mobilized a massive effort to take care of Jewish refugees from Europe. Now, I mentioned this, that he had been in Harbin. These people had come from Harbin. So Harbin was inside Manchuria, but the Russian Tsar 
wanted to sell that area on the border with Manchuria, figured that this would be a possible trading post for business with China and the Far East. And he figured how would he get good people to go there who would want to go to Siberia? And he says, I'll send Jews there because as far as you can get from Mother Russia and still be inside Russia, and I'll promise them privileges that they can't get inside Russia. So Jews went to that area, settled on the border, and then got into Harbin. So that's what they were doing there. All right. So Anatoly's father was in that area because he was in the Russian military because the Russians had a policy of drafting Jews, hoping they would drop dead. If you survive 25 years, then you're free to go. So his father survived 25 years and then settled in that area. So here's a st his story in a nutshell from the United States Holocaust Museum. So he was born 1900 in Irkutsk, right? That's where his father had settled. So 1920, he and his brothers, David and Leo, moved to Harbin, Manchuria, and they began a business of importing woolens from Japan. All right, so here is their store, Ponve. And then whatever is the Chinese characters for Ponve. So his full name, Ponveski, he then went to Japan to run the export side of the business and moved to Kobe. There he organized the Ashkenazic Jewish community, 25 families, built a synagogue there. Very active, very, very deeply Jewish fellow. His father did not let the 25 years in the Russian military wipe out his Jewish. And the opposite, he became out more Jewish than ever before and made sure his sons felt very Jewish. And we can see this. In 1940 and 41, 2,000 Polish Jewish refugees arrived in Kobe. The entire Jewish community is headed by Komponjewski, Ponevesky, and his brother-in-law, Moise, Moise, Moiseyev, and Leo Hannon conducted major relief efforts and persuaded Japanese authorities to issue permits to expand the stay of refuge of, in Kobe. And they created this organization, JUCOM. Right? Before there was a dot-com, there was a JUCOM. And they sent money for ship fares for refugees stranded in Vladivostok, again, as far as you could get from the Soviet Union before you ran into the ocean. And when the funds ran low, they appealed to the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee in New York for added money. So here's that committee that is trying to arrange things. Ponve, as far as I can tell, is this fellow. You go one, two, three, if you see where I have my arrow there, sitting right here, that is Anatoly Ponveski. Ponveski. And then 1941 left Kobe because they had medical problems. And that was before World War II broke out from the, with the United States. And his ah. wife and daughter were ah. stuck in Japan. Well, no, they were stuck in Manila. They were trying to get out. And that's ah. where they were caught when fighting uh, caught them there. They were held there as prisoners till the, uh, till the end of the war. And he was in New York and he was trying to get visas for refugees still in Japan and working with the Joint Distribution Committee. So they spent that time in New York doing this constructive work. And these are telegrams that he had sent, or he had sent or was sent to him. I'll try to enlarge it a little bit more. So you can see, for example, to Ponevesky urged Joint Committee immediately three months budget to avoid catastrophe. Give particular care, your cable 16th to the Jewish community. <laughs> This one, that was interesting. I'm going to try to enlarge it even more. You can see it on the bottom. It says, addressed to Rabbi Ponebeski in care of Topper. That's his brother. And Cable's uh, situation in perils the lives of 451 students and rabbis in Japan. Uh, and there's a Hotel Pennsylvania conference. The Orthodox rabbis in the United States were very well organized in trying to get uh, help for Jews. And so you can see the signatories, uh, Rabbi Aaron Kotler, for example, Rabbi Kamen, that's some of these very famous names in the American Orthodox, the, the very Orthodox Jewish community. So let's go back to my normal size. So they called him Rabbi, gave him a promotion. So he commuted after the war between the United States and Japan he ran a store in Tokyo, and his employee there was Chuni Sugihara, if any of you know. Sugihara was the Japanese diplomat who saved Jewish lives during the Holocaust in Lithuania. He got visas and helped get them out. So then he became president of the Jewish community and established a Tokyo Jewish Community Center. And then he left. He settled in Los Angeles, changed his name to Panve, and here he was involved with Hollywood Temple Beth El. So we have no Hollywood film, but we have a real 
Flesh and Blood Hero at Hollywood Temple Bethel. And I found this newspaper clipping in the B'nai B'rith Messenger, Anatoly Panvei succeeds Factor at Bethel. And that's his picture then of those years. An outstanding array of talent will perform uh, at this. And they mention uh, here his background and his studies and that he went to Tokyo and he became friends with the princess, Prince Mikasa, brother of Emperor Hirohito, which is very important. And then mentioning here his work on Far Eastern Jewry and active in Hollywood Temple Bethel since the arrival here. All right, so that is their story. Now mention, notice that it says he succeeded in Factor. Who was Factor? Just an interesting aside here. John Factor. We're familiar with the building. We said the upstairs. It's now the Neiman Hall. It was originally called the Factor Hall. John and Rella Factor in their name, in their honor. So here's a newspaper clipping. John Factor, New Temple, Bethel President. I found stuff doesn't disappear. The National Library in Israel has huge archives. They've digitized many things. They've digitized all of the Bnei B'rith Messenger, which was the paper for the Jewish community of the last century. So I found these online. John Factor, noted philanthropist who has served as vice president of <clears throat> Temple Bethel for the past four years, unanimously elected president of the temple for coming years. And his particular interest was building the new school for the children because he believed in educating our children the Jewish way of life. So you remember that picture I showed you, you know the upstairs and you know the downstairs is the college, her college, that was the Hebrew school. And then it became a, a private Jewish high school for a while, Herzl School. The only drawback in the building, it was very, very big, was that because it was underground, there were no windows. So it was a little bit uncomfortable for children, but this way they were able to have a social hall on top. That was his, uh, is doing. Okay, all right, I think I don't remember. Let's see. So, a little bit about John Factor. He was born Iako Faktorovich, and he was the brother of the famous Max Factor of cosmetics industry. And his son, Max Factor Jr., whose actual name was Frank Factor, but just adopted the name, for, I guess, for business, was a member till his passing in the 1990s. And I once met another member of the Factor family who said, oh yes, Hollywood Temple Bethel, my uncle, so whatever the relationship was, Jake the Barber. How do you get the name Jake the Barber? Well, he started out in the hair business like Max Factor did. It's the nickname, but the, uh, something a little bit uh, unsavory behind it because he had what we could say was a colorful life as a younger man and made his money in some very questionable activities and at one time with his wife owning the Stardust Hotel in Las Vegas. And those days you didn't just own a hotel because you're a nice guy. So I'm not gonna go into it, but in later years, he was a known philanthropist. He was JFK's largest donor. And subsequently when he was in hot water was pardoned by JFK. I'm not gonna go into more. Now I'm gonna go to really two, I wanna wrap up with two really very, very significant and good people. I'm, I'm, I'm not going into the rabbis. We have the rabbis in Hollywood Temple, but uh, it was Julian White, who I had known. He worked with the United Synagogue here uh, after that. And uh, Rabbi Ad Jacob Ad, I never met, but he became after this the rabbi of the Sephardic Synagogue. Uh, rabbi Magnin, I remember we did a, a, a concert in his memory, in his honor, a very, very beloved rabbi. Um, before me was uh, Rabbi Gil Collin, who I had known. He had been the head of the Jewish uh, chaplaincy and became left here. Um, again, with uh, millions of fights that the synagogue had in Pasadena, and the there at the congregation there and retired. Uh, and, uh, and there were numerous other rabbis. But, uh, I didn't uh, go into the rabbis. I actually would talk about the people who worked hard for this place. So. I'm looking at this building up on 3rd Street, if you pass by. I believe it still says Youngerman Building. I think it's been sold off since, but it was the original one of the original offices for the Directors Guild of America. They put his name on the building after he passed away. And then he was responsible for getting this beautiful building or set the machinery up for this beautiful building just around the corner from us on Sunset. 
Director's Guild building. So this is from his obituary. Longtime Guild official Joseph C. Youngman died in Los Angeles, complications followed by his wife, 67 years, Molly, children Arthur, Barbara, and 12 grandchildren, 18 great-grandchildren, grandchildren, 18 great-grandchildren. One of the central figures in the history of Directors Guild, DGA, 27 years as the National Executive Secretary, following 25 distinguished years as a production career, prop man at Paramount and went on to be assistant director for legendary directors, William Wellman, Cecil B. DeMille, Ernst Lubitsch, and Ruben Mamoulian. But most important, as the sector, executive secretary with the historic mergers of the Screen Directors Guild with the Radio and Television Directors Guild and the Screen Directors International to form Directors Guild of America in 1960. This is really historically very important. And then the construction of the National Headquarters Building at 7950 Sunset Boulevard during the 50s and the expansion of the Guild offices in Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago. But this is important here in yellow, I highlighted his proudest accomplishment was the creation of the Directors Guild Producer Pension Plan, based upon an ingenious proposal he mapped out one night when he couldn't sleep. Operating from his credo that a strike is an effective weapon until you use it, his pension plan proposal resulted in a major producer contribution to the fund exchange in exchange for surrendering the Guild's lean on post-1948 films. In other words, he, he leveraged the power of a lean against monies owed to the Guild in exchange for setting up a pension fund. And so people who were involved in Hollywood in the directing and produ producing end had some kind of security. I was proud of that. So Planners Retirement was given a lifetime contract as a DGA consultant and then served as trustee for their Educational Benevolent Foundation, annual awards, every Christmas party, annual DGA day at Disneyland, and until his passing would go every day. Well, what was important for us is that he was our honorary life vice president. Molly was a member of our board of trustees. And as I mentioned at his funeral, I said from on behalf of the board, we were called with love his great sedakat to the general maintenance of the temple as well as the nursery school and religious school. His spiritual support and deep concern for the welfare of our temple during its difficult times as well as the good times was invaluable. His wisdom and experience will be sorely missed. He was a very important president at the board meetings that they would have one of the types that helped uh, ruffle sore feathers. We have, when you have a congregation whose board members include a lot of very powerful business people, uh, they tend to get on each other's nerves. And it was somebody like Joe Yagerman who helped settle things. And then I'm gonna talk about the other person who helped ruffle uh, or unruffle these ruffled feathers. And so I'm gonna to go to this pair of brothers who did so very much for the congregation, especially in this last years, and were actually important in a very unusual aspect of the film industry. And I'm gonna wrap up with them because I think that story is so important. I'm gonna show you one of their works. So it's Harry Popkin and his brother, Leo Popkin. A lot of you may know Leo Popkin. Leo was a film director and producer in the United States. He lived longer than he outlived Harry, but Leo left a generous donation to Bethel in his will uh, to, to be distributed after his widow passes on. Uh, so it's waiting for us. And when I left the congregation, Leo used to keep on calling me up for years after that, chat with me all sorts of things and questions. Very nice guy, very warm guy. And then his brother, Harry, his brother, Harry was the one who kept the synagogue afloat. Harry Popkin, executive producer of Million Dollar Productions, a partnership that included Ralph Cooper. I'm gonna talk about that. Longtime chairman of our board. And I believe as long as he was alive, he kept the board from going overboard. At the end of each year, they would have a shortfall in the budget. He would pull out a checkbook and close the gap. He had a big foundation and had a setting, had an established fund just for the synagogue and he would pull it when they needed it. And that would, that's how we always were able to tie things over. So these were from my notes for his eulogy for Harry Popkin. So he owned his first theater in 1929, built one of the largest movie chains in the state. I think it may have been Pacific Theaters, I'm not sure. He involved himself in a variety of entertainment and special and sports ventures. So he made a brave stride into the world of independent movie, movie production in the age of all powerful studios. That's how he did his money. He did... Uh, pull things together, and some of them were very, very successful, and some are actually very high quality. 
His first pictures were perhaps a first in and of them by them first in and of themselves unique because they featured an all black cast for a public that too much would ignore was ignored by then. Uh, for a public that too much ignored them. Sorry, I'm messing up my notes. Sorry, and I'm going to say more about it. One of his films was nominated for five Academy Awards. The film called The Well. They cast such actors as Kirk Douglas, Brian Van Levy, and Ronald Coleman, Robert Young in his films, uh, significant names. But it's not only that he was successful, he was a boon to his fellow human beings. Here's an example. The family still owns, as a souvenir, the door to a Japanese command car. It's signed with movie star names on it. It was an auction prize for bidding for who would buy the most U.S. bonds during the Second World War as a way to finance the war. Harry Popkins versus Al Jolson. And they were bidding and bidding with astronomical sums of money to buy bonds till Joseph finally gave in and let Harry get the prize. So the family holds on to the door. I assume they still have, the family members still have the door. And he had always been a strong supporter of Israel. He was particularly close to the Histadrut, which is Israel's labor federation. And so as I got to know him, I said, you know, our paths had crossed indirectly because I had worked at Beit Berl, which is the college of the labor movement for the Labor Federation. So he was very proud to tell me they'd been a very close friend of the director of the Federation's bank, Banca Poalim, it's the Labor's <laughs> bank. The bank, um, since then, actually in the year that I left that position, the Hisarut Labor Federation privatized its industry. So they privatized Banca Poalim and they privatized Core Industries. Uh, I have a sense that the Tides had shifted in terms of socialism. But he was this friend, Michael Paul, the director. And did I see the convention center there at Beit Berl built in honor of his friend Levinson, Beit Levinson. I said, oh, yes, Beit Levinson. Yes, he had given them a big donation. Had I seen the building? He says, had I seen the building? Not only did I see the building, but part of my job, they asked me to put the mezuzahs on every door, which I did. I don't know how many rooms there were, 100 rooms, something like that. And I put them as a person on each door. So Harry sat on the board of something called the Fund for Higher Education. And sitting on this fund, Abba Evan, famous Abba Evan, who happened to have been the honorary president of Beit Berl, and Mayor Teddy Kalik, the great famous mayor of Jerusalem. And through the Harold, Harry and Francis Popkin Endowment Fund, they could target individual projects and give for example, scholarships at the Hebrew University for promising students. And as I said, they would pull money out of this fund to keep Beth El afloat as well. So just as a curiosity, you've seen the movie Bugsy, I'm sure, Warren Beatty, and he plays Bugsy Siegel. He walks into a Beverly Hills house, puts cash down on the table and takes the house. So like $60,000 in the movie. So that movie, that original house, actually is on the tourist route, but the movie that was used in the movie was Harold, Harry and Francis Popkins' house in Beverly Hills. And he had actually bought that very same house in that same period, and Harry had actually paid cash on the spot for that house in just the same way. And I think it was 45000 at that time. What can you get for 45000 in L.A. today? Maybe the front door to the garage. Mm -hmm. He had a strong social conscience. He told me that he had nightclubs, entertainment venues, and he made a point of hiring a young off-duty cop for security. Gave him a job, gave him a leg up, this young off-duty cop. Well, who was this? Well, we got a certificate from the state of California, city of, uh, city of Los Angeles, state of California. Happiness is Hollywood Temple. It was in honor of our 70th anniversary. And the signatory on the bottom, if you see, Mayor Tom Bradley. Well, let me get back to that. Where did Mayor, Mayor go? Wait a minute. Don't go. Don't go for me. Hold it. Hold it. There we go. Mayor Tom Bradley. You can see the signature. And he was here for some event that we had and delivered it to me in person. Somewhere I have a picture of him giving the certificate to me. Mayor Tom Bradley, very, very successful mayor for Los Angeles, both as African-American and as a mayor, right? So as I said, he started as an off-duty security cop. 
But that's not really what he's famous for. Let's go back down. Here's what's important. In 1937, and this is picked up from something called a, a website. This is the wording for the website. The White Los Angeles Theater owner, Harry M. Popkin, this isn't white, not Jewish, but that's okay. And his movie producer brother, Leo C. Popkin, known for the film DOA, then on arrival, I guess it means 1950, teamed up with the black actor, Ralph Cooper, film Dark Manhattan, 1937, to form million dollar productions. Picking up where the pioneering black filmmaker, Oscar Michaud, left off million dollar moved black filmmaking away from a marginalized form towards the mainstream, advancing considerably its reputation and ability to attract audiences. Yeah. Cooper had founded Amateur Night at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. Many of you know the Apollo Theater, their beautiful venue for uh, entertainments, uh, black entertainment community. 1935 had been bought out by West, had been bought out West by Fox Studios, but it was immediately dropped when he didn't fit the desired stereotype. I don't know what they mean by desired stereotype, but I'll show you a clip and you can see what they mean by not being a stereotype. Now, a million dollar would use the crime gangster genre as a vehicle to make Cooper a star of black cinema. Harry Popkin was already featuring many African American performers on stage and film at his million dollar theater, 307 South Broadway. Built by Sid Grauman, remember Grauman's Chinese Theater on uh, Hollywood. That was his first theater, built in 1918 with William Hart, the Silent Man, first opening. Popkin bought the place in 1935, and in 1940, stage acts ran the integrated gamut from Billy Holiday and Lionel Hampton to Artie Shaw. There's Harold Popkin doing this. Popkin leased the premises in 1945 to Metropolitan Theaters, which added to the Ophium Orpheum vaudeville circuit and booked acts like Nat King Cold Trio. Then 1949 subleased to Frank Fauci and so on. And you can see eventually it was sold for 300 million to Hallmark rebranded as Univision, Univision broadcasting to the Hispanic community. Well, million dollar productions didn't last long. It's filmmaking days over by 1942, but created a lasting legacy in 1938 when it paired Cooper with a hitherto unknown actress in The Duke is Tops. Nine or 10 months later, when Harry Popkin penned the history that's featured here or above, he obviously didn't know what he had done. He mentions the long forgotten film and its lead male by name, but doesn't mention his co-star. Her name was Lena Horn. So this is from something called SCB History. Modern scripture. So this is a letter that Harry Popkin's penned and it was to be buried in the corner of the Valverde Clubhouse on April 16th, 1939. I guess somebody unearthed it. And talk about Million Dollar Productions, May 1937, producing an all-colored cast, modern class A talking pictures with themes taken from modern Negro life. Headed by Harry Popkin, executive producer, production department, uh, this is Ralph Cooper, and distribution department, there's Leo Popkin. Stars under the contract, Ralph Cooper, Louis Bevers, Edward Thompson, Lawrence Kreiner, Rachel Fenderson, Monty Hawley. First, production, first picture, Bargain with Bullets. And then talks about some of the others. I think Life Goes On. And then The Duke is Tops, starring Ralph Cooper, 1938, Gag Smashers, Reform School. All right. At this writing, the company's complete plans produced for the first time in the history of motion pictures, film depicting the part the Negro has played in the upbuilding, cultural development, and art of America. Also, his patriotic nature son, Harry M. Popkin, executive producer. Well, there is Harry Popkin. And this must be, I guess, from the 30s. Notice his mustache. He kept a very thin, thin mustache. Remember the... Uh, if you ever saw Adolf Manjou, our actor of that period, his pencil mustache was very, very much in. Yeah, yeah my father only had a mustache like that. This, in one side says this is Leo Popkin, another side it says it's Harry Popkin. Uh, I, I suspect maybe that is Leo, because Leo was thinner, thinner build. So maybe that is actually a picture of Leo and just mislabeled. But uh, here I wanna just wrap up with a scene from one of the movies featuring Ralph Cooper and Lena Horne. 
The film is called Duke is Tops. But after the public sees it, they love her. It becomes re-released as The Bronze Venus. And from now on, Lena Horne becomes top name in entertainment. So I'm going to start the first 20 seconds here with the credits. Just so you believe me, who's in it. Let's see if I can get this to go. There we go. So I want to show you on this. She certainly needed Duke. Yes. And he needed her. Now when I get to the very beginning. There. Wait, are we there yet? There we go. The very beginning. Harry and Popkin presents. So I want to go past the credits quickly to one scene, a very beautiful stage, musical. It's the ending scene where Lena Horne sings. And we'll just move right on to that because it's an hour long movie. You can watch it, you can follow this link and uh, watch the rich. <laughs> That's Ralph Cooper. Thank you. 
So very significant because the image that Hollywood had done with, for the American public was the step and fetch it character or uh, in Gone with the Wind, the loyal servant maid, right? Now you have a different image of the African-American and that's what Harold and Leo were doing. And that's Hollywood Temple Beth L's contribution to American civilization by being a home for people like this. So uh, with, with that, I, I think we, we've come across some of the better events of Hollywood Temple Bethel and uh, in, in its heyday. So I'm going to close this down, stop share. Gonna wish everybody Shabbat Shalom and everything. and uh, I'm going to try to take the two clips that I had, put them together, and run a story. I'm going to send it to the Academy. I'm going to send it to Screen Directors Guild. I don't know, whoever else I can find. And just send them all the story. Let's see who picks it up. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens from that. All right, listen, to everybody have a good Shabbos. Take care. Right. Good Shabbos. Bye-bye.